Hi and welcome to part 3 of my 2018 GCSE Media Studies Revision Series. We're talking about institution this time, which basically means the business model behind TV dramas. So we're going to be looking at all three stages of making a TV drama. Production, marketing and distribution. So let's start off by talking about who produces TV dramas and how they're funded. Now, it's really important to understand that there are essentially two parties in this process. The production company is the group that literally films, edits, and delivers the uh, finished product. So for example, Stranger Things was produced by 21 Laps Entertainment. Then you have the distributor, who is the company that usually finances and then distributes the product. So again, just looking at Stranger Things as an example, Netflix will have paid 21 Laps Entertainment to finance the entire series so that Netflix could then distribute it and make money by having it on their online platform. Now, sometimes distributors are able to produce their own content in-house like the BBC via their own production companies. Now, obviously, just like Netflix, the BBC outsource an awful lot of their programming, like Sherlock, which was produced by the production company Hartswood Films. But they also produce an awful lot of their own content via a subsidiary company of theirs called BBC Studios, with programs like Doctor Who in their portfolio. Now, what's most interesting about the production of TV dramas in the last decade or so is just how much budgets and production values have escalated. Once upon a time, there was a very clear divide between the quality of dramas found on TV and that in movie dramas. But it's now completely commonplace to find a TV series matching the quality of what you'd find in a Hollywood movie. And it's even apparent in the talent that we're now seeing on TV. Take House of Cards on Netflix as a prime example. It starred Hollywood A-lister Kevin Spacey, and the pilot was even directed by David Fincher, famed for directing Fight Club 7 and The Social Network. So what happened? Why did this change? I think this is simply a case of distributors noticing a change in the audience's behavior. More and more often around the late 2000s, audiences were choosing to stay at home to consume the media. So rather than going to the cinema, they'd rather just stay at home and watch a few episodes of Game of Thrones or The Walking Dead. Because of this behavior, distributors are investing more and more money in TV dramas because that's where the audience is and thereby that's where the money is. So let's look at a couple more case studies. Stranger Things was commissioned by Netflix for an undisclosed amount. But what we do know is within the first 35 days, it was watched by 14 million people. That's a massive success. The Crown, which is one of Netflix's uh, very recent huge successes internationally, was commissioned for a reported $130 million for an entire season. Just to put that into context, Titanic, which was one of the most expensive films ever made at the time, was produced for $200 million. Is it worth that much money? Did they make their money back? Absolutely. In 2017, Netflix reported earnings of $11 billion. So, once a program has been made, the next most important step is to make people want to watch it by marketing it across a range of channels. For this, we'll be looking at Stranger Things as an example again. The first and most important form of marketing is the trailer, which is most commonly found on the distributor's primary platforms. So, for example, the BBC advertise all of their programs during the intermission between programs on their own channels. Netflix, too, offer a mini trailer whenever you hover over a program in the menu select. But there are plenty of other outlets for trailers too, YouTube being one of the biggest platforms. In the case of Stranger Things, the second season trailer was famously shown at the 2017 Super Bowl, one of the most expensive advertising slots in the world. It was later released on YouTube and viewed 16 million times. Now, in the context of the exam, it's quite possible that you'll be asked to storyboard a trailer for your chosen drama. So it's really important that you understand the conventions of a trailer. Here's just a few for example. They tend to feature an awful lot of fade to black transitions. They'll offer a hook in the form of numerous disruptions that appear throughout the season. They'll introduce key characters and the relationships that they have with each other. They'll use titles to provide context and often shout out about the accolades of the show's producers. They'll slowly build to a climactic finish when the show's titles are shown with the release date. And of course, they'll always prioritize action and excitement from the entire season. Needless to say, if you aren't already, you need to become really, really familiar with the conventions of a trailer. Beyond trailers, Stranger Things was marketed via social media very, very effectively. It obviously had a presence on all of the major platforms from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram. If you check out the Instagram feed for Stranger Things, what they do is they post an awful lot of memes which are quite funny and very likely to be shared and then go viral, which is just raising awareness of the show. Twitter is an excellent announcement service which Stranger Things used to uh, let people know when a new trailer had been released or the release date of the second season. 
and of course also offered the chance for fans to engage and interact with the service. Stranger Things Season 2 even had a retro-style mobile app, which was released in synergy with the actual show. The game's blocky 80s graphics mirrored the setting of the show and was offered for free, meaning even more people were made aware of the show's release date. Again, just to put this in the context of the exam, if you're asked for some ideas of how to market your drama, have a think about how you would use apps and games and social media to promote your own TV drama. Would you post memes on social media? Or perhaps you could make a uh, fictional website uh, taken from the actual setting, the world of your drama. And finally, we need to talk a little bit about how TV dramas are distributed to the audience. Traditionally, this had always been via broadcast channels like the BBC and ITV. This is obviously still done, and it presents some interesting considerations when we think about scheduling. Now, the most important thing about scheduling is putting programs where they're most likely to be seen by the target audience. As such, TV dramas have usually occupied the primetime slot on terrestrial TV channels. In the UK, this is roughly 6pm to 10.30pm, when people are getting back from work and school ready to relax. On the one hand, this pays testament to the popularity of the genre, but also tells us something about what we can expect of the content of a TV drama. Family dramas such as Doctor Who are more likely to be shown before the 9 o'clock watershed, so the content is going to be less violent, less graphic than that after. Now, the closer we get to the 9 o'clock watershed, the less strict broadcasters need to be with what they broadcast. So the more adult-themed shows, such as The Assassination of Gianni Versace, is shown at 9 o'clock. Absolute peak viewing time for adult audiences, but also completely acceptable to show a lot more uh, blood, gore, swearing, sex, that kind of thing. Now, if we look at the more modern forms of distribution, we obviously encounter streaming services and on-demand. So, in the case of the BBC, they have the iPlayer, and Netflix uh, exists entirely online. So what does this mean for audiences? Well, two things, really. First, for the audience, it means convenience to watch whatever they want, whenever they want, which kind of makes the whole idea of scheduling redundant. I think this is probably the biggest contributor to the binge-watching culture that I discussed earlier. Secondly, it means that the content the audience is being offered is going to get more and more personalized the more the service gets to know their viewing habits. Now, the BBC and all of the on-demand services do this, but let's just stick with Netflix for a case study. When you first sign into Netflix, the service will already know a few very telling pieces of information about you. Data such as your age and location will help algorithms tailor their vast library to your tastes. So a teenage boy from the UK will likely be welcomed by shows such as Lost in Space and 13 Reasons Why, whereas an adult man in the UK will more likely be shown Breaking Bad or House of Cards. But this is just the beginning of how Netflix uses data to tailor their experience. Netflix uses data about the audience's viewing habits to help offer suggestions of what you should watch next. So they'll look at what people watched after Stranger Things and how many of those people remained for the full season or gave up after a few episodes. Or they can look at what people of a similar demographic to yours watch at what time of day. In the morning you might be shown non-fiction, whereas in the evening you're shown more drama. That's all for this episode. Now, you need to start thinking about how you're going to be using this information in the exam. As far as question one goes, you absolutely need to know the production context of your two chosen TV dramas that you've studied inside out. Just like I've explained to you the budget, production context, marketing and distribution of Stranger Things in this video. For question three or four, it's very likely that you'll be asked to justify the institutional background for your chosen idea. So when you get your preliminary materials, consider how would you market it? Where would you like it to be broadcast? How would you use social media? As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time for the final video in this series where we'll be talking about the exam itself.